Hey folks! Today we're talking about theories and discourses related to interprofessional education and practice. Now one of the things that was raised in our previous reading by Van Hoof et al. was that there's no one good theory to explain interprofessional education, and I would argue that we can say the same thing about interprofessional collaboration and teamwork as well. So why do we bother with theory at all? To be honest, I didn't find theory particularly interesting or helpful until I took my IPE course in my master's degree, and that was kind of my aha moment when it came to theory. Uh, particularly it was the more sociological theories pertaining to professionalization and power that really got me interested in theory which we're going to discuss a bit more today. So our reading by Reeves et al. 2010 this week explains how theories provide different lenses through which we can look at complicated problems and social issues, focusing on different aspects of a phenomenon and providing a framework for understanding them. So if we want to understand this maybe from more of an um, interdisciplinary lens to see what Reeves means by this, um, for example, I can see issues different depending on whether I have my nursing cap on, so to speak, or if I'm looking at the issue through more of an educator lens. Um, I may think that an educational intervention sounds great for my experience and training as an educator, but when I look at it through a nursing lens, I'll poke all sorts of holes through it and vice versa. And we can say the same about theories because it will have us looking at different aspects of the issue. So for example, I'm going to see an educational issue differently if I'm looking at it through a constructivist lens versus a theory more aligned with um, post-structural discourses, which looks at issues of power or theories associated with authentic education and democratic citizenship education, respectively, for those of you who read Engaging Minds in EDU 5101. And Reeves et al. 2010 also points out that theories can generate knowledge, which can be then generalized and transferred across settings. And learning theories more specifically, such as constructivism, are also a great tool for us as educators. So as educators, sometimes we'll end up in situations where we feel lost or like we're flying by the seat of our pants. For those of you who have taken previous courses with me, you may recognize this quote. Um, it would be useful to be able to turn to a set of guiding principles based on evidence, or at least to some long-term successful experience. So in short, learning theories give us that guiding set of principles that can help inform our teaching. Learning theories can also help us understand what drives and impedes learning, and putting principles of learning theories into practice can help improve our teaching practice. So some examples of learning theories relevant to interprofessional education include reflective learning, experiential learning, situated learning in communities of practice, principles of adult learning or andragogy, and complexity science. And I had initially planned on talking more about these learning theories here, but I do have quite a few previous videos where I talk about each of these theories pretty in depth, which I'll link down below. I think the only one I don't have a video on is reflective learning. But I gather from the emails that I've been receiving from my learners over the past week is that the piece that the class seems to be very keen to hear more about is discourses and theories related to power and hierarchy um, and professionalization. I don't think I've actually ever previously gotten so many emails from my learners about readings. Um, a lot of you said that you found the readings really interesting and that some of the issues that were discussed, particularly the more sociological issues of surrounding power and hierarchy, um, really resonated with you and your experiences as healthcare professionals working in interprofessional groups. And many of you emailed to just say that you wanted to take an idea from here for your final project. So I thought we would focus more on that here. Um, but that being said, if you do have any questions about the learning theories piece that isn't covered in my previous videos, please feel free to let me know and I will absolutely address them. So social science theories and discourses. So the discussion here is going to be more influenced by the types of theories that were discussed in Reeves et al's chapter, um, as well as some of the um, focus readings that dealt more with issues of power. So this discussion is going to be more so influenced by social sciences, particularly sociology, and here I really want to highlight um, professionalization and power, so looking at the works of Fritzen and Michel Foucault. So a lot of the issues that we see here are very much wrapped up in history, um, including the history of gender and social class, for example. For example, the hierarchical structure that we see in healthcare and the stereotypes of the, you know, the domineering male physician and mothering female nurses. I mean, just look at the images in the doctor-nurse games. And this is all rooted in history, gender inequality, social class, and due largely to the robust nature of gender inequality, these issues still persist today. Uh, medicine is certainly an area where we have seen some shifts. For example, the number of applicants um, and medical students who identify as women, but nursing still tends to be very female dominated. Anyways, I'm going to come back to these sorts of issues in a moment, but before we move on, I just wanted to remind everyone that when we're discussing these issues, that history is written by the victor. And I'm sure many of you heard this back in your social studies classes, your history classes, 
But this is also true when we're talking about the history of health professions and health professions education. Um, so there's a great book chapter by Chester et al. 2011, which mentions that we want to keep this in mind when we're reading anything on the history of health professions because it shapes the narrative that's told. And so they give a really great example of the nursing profession. So historical account that's written by medicine is often based on the assumption that um, nursing emanated from medicine, giving rise to that stereotype as nurses as being doctors handmaidens. But perspectives that are told from nursing would argue that nursing comes from a completely different line of caregivers, including lay healers, including witches, as they would have been described as back in the day, and midwives. And within Western nursing, at least, we do have very distinct traditions in nursing, so that of the lay healer and religious practitioner. So as you're reading up on interprofessional education and practice throughout the semester, including exploring the history of your topics for your final projects, just keep this at the back of your mind. So let's start off this discussion by talking about professionalization and professional closure. And both of our assigned readings this week talked about professionalization and the work of Elliot Friedson. So I have here his book, Professional Dominance, The Social Structure of Medical Care. Excellent book. I highly recommend if this area interests you. It's an oldie but a goodie. So in this book, Friedson analyzes medicine as the dominant profession within healthcare. So what a lot of what I talk about here is going to be pretty focused on medicine, but I assure you it's relevant to other professions and interprofessional practice. So let's start off about professions and autonomy. So what even is a profession? So Friedson defines a profession as being an aggregate of people finding identity and sharing values and skills absorbed during the course of intensive training through which they have all passed. Now, note that this is a more sociological understanding of uh, what a profession is. And so here, determining whether someone is a professional entails looking at whether or not they have internalized certain given professional values. So in short, it's about conformity to a given set of norms. And our reading by Sargent offers a pretty similar definition. Um, so Sargent describes a profession as being a specifically socialized and educated group that controls its own work, holds shared goals and values, and is committed to doing the work and gaining approval and respect of colleagues. Now, I don't think Friedson says anything about gaining approval or respect from colleagues from what I remember, but there's a lot of other parallels here that we're going to discuss. So a really important aspect here about professions that Sargent mentioned and Friedson absolutely talks about in this book is that professions are autonomous. So autonomy means that they're not controlled by outsiders. They are independent and self-directing, or as Sargent puts it, they control their own work. Now, arguably within healthcare, from Friesen's perspective, um, the only truly autonomous occupations are medicine and dentistry. So Friedson would argue that these are the only true professions within healthcare in a sociological sense. So these professions can direct the work of others, but others are unable to formally evaluate them or direct their work. So something I was thinking about as I was doing some rereading of Friedson this week was if I could think of any examples where this has really shifted. And I do know there are some examples um, within competency medical education where other professions like nursing are invited to evaluate medical residences. But I would say, my understanding, largely this is still true. So other professional groups that don't have this kind of autonomy, Friedson would call a paraprofession. So sociologically speaking, from Friedson's perspective, nursing, for example, would be considered a paraprofession because we don't have that same kind of autonomy. And sometimes other occupational groups will try to use the term profession in order to improve their image in a social status kind of way. So let's talk a little bit more here about medical dominance and prestige. So Friedson talks about how medicine is considered to be the most prestigious and authoritative health profession, and is the prototype that other paraprofessions often model themselves after. And medicine as a profession manages to maintain its dominant position while other paraprofessions and occupations in health and social care grow and struggle for increased access to what Friedson calls the task of healing. And medicine has achieved this position largely because it has legal monopoly on health care, including prescribing, diagnosis, hospital privileges, etc. And as a result, the paraprofessions can do very little without the authority of physicians. And this monopoly was achieved through professional closure, which our reading um, by Reeves this week discussed. So professional closure here refers to the securement of exclusive ownership of a specific areas of knowledge and expertise in order to effectively secure economic reward and status enhancement. So within healthcare, medicine was the first group to achieve this professional closure. So medicine as a profession has a monopoly on a lot of the more prestigious areas of work like diagnostics and prescribing. And we are starting to see some changes here. Um, as our reading by Reeves points out this week, nurse practitioners can prescribe and diagnose. 
but medicine is still realistically on the top of the healthcare hierarchy. And in the textbook, they also share some examples of um, tensions between chiropractors and physicians within sports medicine. Now, arguably, professional closure can't be achieved without licensing of practice, which grants the individual the right to that monopoly of practice. And to protect this economic and status reward that has been claimed by the profession, um, the professions regulate entry to practice requirements and maintenance of professional status. So, for example, um, there are certain requirements that you need to be able to meet to practice as a nurse in Canada, um, to practice as a physician in Canada. There's some differences provincially, too. Um, and then also maintaining your professional status, such as requirements for continuing professional development. And as our reading by Reeves points out, we are more likely to see tensions between professions when one profession starts to infringe on the area of expertise of another. And this can help us understand why we can sometimes see friction in IPE activities between the different professional groups. Now, Friedson also has quite a bit to say about education. So he states that um, education and training plays into professionalization because professional groups need to be able to produce and apply knowledge and skills in their work in order to be self-directing. And having segregated professional schools, um, such as schools of nursing, schools of human kinetics, etc., implies that these different professions have some sort of special content that one can't find in the other programs, which may or may not be the case because there is considerable overlap in a lot of the programs. And this is also used to exclude others from the profession because professional schooling is a criteria for that license and registration. And as kind of a side note here, professions can also exclude other occupational categories by simply just creating a new subdivision or specialty within their own professional domain. Now, professional programs also have a socialization function. So Friedson focuses specifically on medicine, but we can apply this principle to other health and social care professions. So he gives the example of medical schools and how medical schools teach students the attitudes and behaviors that are supposedly required to play the role of a doctor well. And the underlying assumption here is that the person can be essentially recreated into a whole new person. So the ideal doctor. And an article by Whitehead 2007 describes this as being a process of identity development as a doctor or identity development as a nurse, dental hygienist, occupational therapist, etc. And White goes on to talk about how medical students have been traditionally socialized to be the leader and the decision maker. And this makes things tricky for interprofessional education and practice because within interprofessional work, there is a degree of um, shared decision making, shared leadership, etc. Um, and I might actually assign this reading by Whitehead next week as a focused reading because I think many of you would really enjoy it when we're discussing barriers to interprofessional education and practice. And our reading by Sargent mentions that the educational system doesn't prepare medical students for this change to a more collaborative type of decision making. Now, a lot of time has passed since this article, and I would say anecdotally at least, um, as someone who works with and teaches a lot of physicians, I have seen a lot of growth here over the past decade. Um, there seems to be a lot more awareness on this issue. However, I've been working in educational research settings where the physicians I work with tend to be very inclined toward interprofessional and interdisciplinary education and collaboration. So there could be a bit of a bias um, in terms of the physicians that I work with. So I would be really interested in actually hearing from the physicians and surgeon learners in our class about how this relates to your own experiences in UGME, PGME, clinical practice, etc. And while Friedson doesn't explicitly use the term interprofessional collaboration or education in his book, I do think he does hint at it at least. Um, when he's discussing reforming healthcare, he does state that um, ideally in a utopian hospital, those connected to the delivery of healthcare services would function as a team, including the patient, um, and that is not hindered by hierarchy or poor communication. And I wanted to end things off by talking a little bit more about power and the work of Michel Foucault. So our focused reading by Cohen and colleagues mentioned that Foucault's work explores many diverse themes. However, power underlies much of his work. So broadly speaking, a Foucauldian perspective problematizes the uncritical acceptance of anything that is presented as natural or necessary. Uh, so for those of you who read Engaging Minds in EDU 5101, this type of thinking would be very much related to the ideas presented in democratic citizenship education. And um, Freire's work, which is mentioned in our reading by Cohen and colleagues, would also fall under this categorization. And from this perspective, uncritical acceptance allows for power relations to devolve into static states of domination. Foucault also proposes that power is omnipresent and it can be found in all social interactions. And it emerges from relationships and interactions. So from a Foucauldian perspective, power is exercised rather than being possessed. And power, while oppressive at times, also has the ability to liberate. 
as it runs through the entire social body in modern and late modern contexts. And so within our reading by Reeves et al. this week, the authors specifically talk about Foucault's work on discourse and surveillance. So discourses are knowledge systems of ideas, attitudes, actions, and beliefs and practices that influence how individuals think, see, and speak. And according to Foucault, these discourses help to define a particular culture, its language, and the behaviors of the individuals who belong to that culture. And this includes professional cultures, which we're going to talk about more next week. But in short, these discourses help shape cultures and what is accepted as being fact or truth. And in his book, Discipline and Punish, which I also own, um, Foucault talks more about surveillance. So he believed that some level of surveillance is required to maintain the existence of particular discourses, which makes it another dimension of power. And our reading by Reeves talks about how Foucault draws upon the notion of panopticon here. And I'll try to find some better images than what is uh, up here in the book. But in short, panopticon refers to it. Um, an institutional building designed by philosopher and social theorist Jeremy Bentham in the 18th century, in which prisoners were not aware whether or not they would be watching by guards. So in, in, Pan in the Panopticon, there is a central tower from which a single guard can see all the prisoners who are in a rotunda, but the prisoners can't see into the tower, so they don't know if they're actually being watched or now. So they will behave like they're always being watched and thus self-regulate their behavior. And so while most of Bentham's work focused on this layout for prisons, he saw it as also being applicable to other settings such as asylums, hospitals, and schools. And for those of you who read Engaging Minds, um, the authors actually do make reference to this idea of panopticon and how schools, hospitals, and asylums did adopt and adapt this design. And indeed, when I look at pictures of the panopticon, it does remind me um, not only of the layout of some of the clinical units that I worked on were as a nurse at the nursing station I was in the center and my patients were all around me and I could see them all from the station and it also reminds me of the lecture hall where as um, the lecturer we're up at the front and we can see everyone and that's all for now folks I hope this little discussion about professionalization socialization and power um, helped clarify some of the ideas that came up in the readings as well as provided a nice primer for when we talk about conflict and barriers into professional education and practice next week. Do let me know if you have any questions or if you'd like me to talk further about learning theory specifically beyond what I've discussed in previous videos. Um, I would be more than happy to chat about that further. So thanks for listening and I will see you all online. Bye!